Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Rachel, thank you so much for coming here today to talk to me. Rachel is a friend, a sorority sister, a fellow mom, a comedian, and lawyer. She showed up on my doorstep in France in 2018. It was pretty amazing. And she was one of my very, very, very favorite sorority sisters. Additionally, Rachel also has an incredible brand new podcast. I even came on for her second episode. Tell us about it, Rachel. Okay. So it's called Love Before 100. And the concept is that I'm divorced, I'm single, I'm out there dating, I'm looking for love. So I created a scavenger hunt bucket list. I'm calling it kind of a combination between Sex and the City and Jackass, where I go down this list and there's points and I'm trying to find love before I hit hundred points or hundred years old, whichever comes first. And yes, Michelle was on it. Um, kind of a play off this podcast, how not to date a serial killer. We went through some profiles. We talked about what to look for and listen for. It was a lot of fun. So I'm excited for that to come out. So listeners, if you're not only interested in how not to raise a serial killer, but you also want to know how not to date one, you got to go hit up Rachel's podcast. Absolutely. So Rachel is an incredible person, a great friend, a great mom, and a great guest, and somebody who I think will help me dig deep into this. This is the case of the killer gene. Is there a gene that can lead someone to becoming a murderer? I say it all the time that there's genetic underpinnings for violent crime, but is there a single gene? Well, the short answer and the accurate answer is no, but... There are some genes, some single genes that are associated with violent crime. And we're going to tell a story about a person who had that gene and what happened. Are you ready? I'm ready. So this is the story of Brad Waldrup. He and his wife, Penny, started dating as teenagers in Meigs County, Tennessee, kind of a small place. Not a lot of humans. And there's not a lot to do. So they're dating, and she got pregnant pretty quickly. And then they got married and had three more kids. Penny and Paul decided to raise these four kids in kind of a rural part of Tennessee, which the children remember as being idyllic. And they also remember their mom, Penny, as a wonderful, loving mom. But that is not how they remember their father, who they describe as a monster and who everyone else described as abusive, domineering and controlling. Because of that, Penny spent a lot of time with her childhood best friend, Leslie. And Leslie also had a lot of children. She had five of them. And Penny would take her children over to Leslie's house often so that the kids could play together and so that she just had a safe place to be not under Brad's thumb. While not everybody knew the extent of the abuse going on, everybody knew that Brad made all the rules and Penny was expected to follow them. So in the summer of 2006, Penny was spending most of her time over at Leslie's. And there were instances of violence that her friends did actually witness. Like one time Penny fled her home, she ended up at Leslie's, she's trying to escape. But then Brad shows up, demands that Penny returns, and then begins to strangle her in front of everybody. Leslie, her friend, literally had to jump on Brad, pull him off, and save Penny. Penny was purple. Penny knew her relationship was abusive and unacceptable, but she also, you know, she's young. She's got four kids with this guy. She's been with him since she was a teenager. It was not going to be easy to leave. He wasn't going to be left easily, but it wouldn't be easy on her either, you know, trying to survive like that. The devil she knew, I suppose, was a little easier than the devil she didn't know. 
She did try to keep her family together as long as she could, but eventually she realized that she had to leave. It just had escalated to the point where his drinking and aggression was too much. She was exhausted, and Brad was not getting any better. Penny finally filed for divorce, and Brad went to go live at his grandma's house. So now it's fall. It's October of 2006. Brad is still living alone at his grandma's house, which is on this mountain with nobody nearby. And Penny had filed for divorce, but she has to honor the shared custody of the four kids. So she has to bring these four little children up to Brad on this isolated mountain. They're no longer together as a couple, but even she says this was really important to me to maintain their relationship with their father. But because of all the threats that Brad had made, Penny was deathly afraid to go up to drop off the kids herself. So her wonderful best friend, Leslie, offers to go with her. Now, Leslie is not afraid of Brad. She's very protective of Penny. She has his number. She thinks he's all hot air. She is not going to let Penny go up there by herself. But this is no small gesture of friendship because at this point, Brad had already threatened to kill Penny if she didn't come back or to make her life a living hell if she did. So nobody trusted this guy. They had no choice. They had to bring the kids. And Leslie wasn't going to let Penny do that alone. But Leslie has five of her own children. So Penny and Leslie ask a third friend, Dachi, to come over and watch Leslie's five children while Leslie accompanies Penny up to Brad's house. And the three women, all knowing Brad, they make a plan. Penny and Leslie were going to drive out on the highway, and they were going to call Dachi right when they turned off the highway before they would lose cell reception as they drove up Kimsey Mountain. And if they did not call back within 30 minutes to an hour, Dachi was instructed to go ahead and call the police. Penny had a very bad feeling that this was not going to go over well, and she was so nervous that she even left a note with Dachi with their vehicle information, her children's names and birth dates, everybody's cell phone numbers. It was no, like, bye, see you later. Everybody was nervous about this. So at this point, Penny, Leslie, and the Penny's four children head out, and they are supposed to be back at 7 or 7.30, or they're at least supposed to call. When they get off the highway and they start heading up the mountain, they do exactly what they said, but Penny says something really haunting. When Dachi says, I'll see you when you get back, Penny says, if I get back. To create a visual for the next few moments, I wish I could show you this photo of Penny and Brad. He looks exactly like you think he's going to look. He looks angry, even in the photo. He looks domineering. And she's this, like, beautiful young girl. And you can almost see how this plays out in the photo, but it's just a photo. When they arrive to Brad's house, the four kids get out, they unload their luggage, and they bring it into his house. But at that point, Brad comes out with a rifle. Like, this escalates fast. And he's drunk. He's pissed. There's an altercation between Brad and Leslie, and he accuses her of being the reason why his marriage to Penny has failed. He accuses her, basically, of poisoning Penny. Well, Penny and Brad's son, Elijah, is looking out the window at this time, and he says he sees his father raise the rifle and shoot Leslie. So, of course, Penny jumps out of the car to render aid to her bestie, but her friend is dead. So Penny starts running from Brad. He raises the rifle as she's running away and shoots her in the back, in front of her children, who are all watching through the window. There's a show on Investigation Discovery called No One Can Hear You Scream, and the son describes just how terrified he was, watching his mom being hunted down like prey. I mean, he didn't say that. I said that part. But he was terrified watching his father try to kill his mom. So after she's shot, she's on the ground, but she gets up and she starts to run. But there's literally nowhere to go. There are no neighbors. There's no cell reception. There's, there's nothing out there. She's shot again and again in the back until he runs out of ammunition. So at this point, he goes up to her and he drags her to the creek by the house the son is still watching. And he tries to cut her throat with a knife. But that's not doing it. 
So he goes and gets a rusty machete, and he tries to hack her to death. I don't, I don't know how this woman survived it. All four of her children are witnessing this. They are screaming. They are crying. And they're, you know, they're sure that this is the last time they're going to see their mom again. But by some miracle, Penny survives. And she is begging for her life. So Brad drags Penny over to Leslie's lifeless body. And then he starts hacking into Leslie, dead Leslie's head with a machete. It's so bizarre. And I, it's so bizarre that Penny's still alive, that there's a machete, that she's lying next to her best friend, Leslie, that the children have a front row seat to this. Brad drags this bloody and battered Penny, who's now been shot and hacked with a machete back into the house. And he tells the kids, kids, say goodbye to your mom. But at this point, not only are they deathly afraid that their mom is going to die, but they're now pretty sure their dad's going to kill them too. Meanwhile, back at home, Dachi does not hear from Penny and Leslie when she's supposed to, so of course she's calling the police. And they were, like, pretty nonplussed about it. And and I understand why. I mean, there was no report. There's no restraining order. It's just, hey, can you do a welfare check? This guy's kind of a jerk. They said they would. They said, well, you know, when an officer becomes available, we'll send him up. So she literally calls every 15 minutes, Dochi does. And they just kept saying the same thing to her. You know, she tells them, look, this guy's dangerous. We're scared. And here's an important side note. If there are no restraining orders or, or orders of personal protection in place, law enforcement can't do much unless they catch somebody in the act of violence. I always say, if there's been any threat, if there's been any act of violence, go ahead and at least let your local uh, law enforcement know. I recognize that a restraining order can poke the bear and it can, you know, infuriate a violent person. But the flip side to that is if they don't know, they have to just treat it like they would treat anybody in this situation who isn't becoming a violent criminal. So it's just good to at least put them on notice. Back to Penny, who is now not only fearing for her own life, but the life of her children too, because you can't reason with him. It's like hes he was saying that he was evil. He was out of his mind. And she's trying. She tries everything you've seen in the movies. She tries to remind him of the good times. She tells him he's not evil and that she still loves him. They can make it work. She's just buying time because she knows that Dochi would have called the police by now. And she knows eventually they'll get there. And while she's trying to persuade Brad, Penny eventually passes out from incredible blood loss, I imagine. When she wakes up, he's standing over her and laughing. He told her that he wanted to see her die slowly and was considering keeping her alive like for the whole weekend just so he could watch her suffer. And then he begins to rape her. But right then the police arrive. Now, I mentioned this is just a welfare check. So it's one officer and he's just coming up. Like, like, you know, welfare checks are not uncommon. Usually everything's fine. So he knew he was over his head when, you know, once bloody Penny comes running out of the house. So he's freaking out. He's like, do I take her to the hospital? He's calling for backup. He sees Brad, but Brad actually surrenders to the officer. He doesn't try to kill the officer. And once the other officers and the ambulance arrives, Brad, of course, still taunts Penny, telling Penny that he's not done with her. So I've seen the police photos, and they're pretty traumatizing. Penny looks like something from The Walking Dead. She is so bloody and battered with, like, machete wounds that look like axe wounds. Like, it is horrifying. Her pinky's missing. It's horrifying. Looks like a movie. I can't believe she survived this. Brad is charged with first-degree murder of Leslie Bradshaw you know, the best friend, and attempted murder of Penny Waldrop. But here's where our podcast comes in. During the trial, it is revealed that Brad has this rare variant of a gene, the MAOA gene, which is also known as the warrior gene. And because of this, he wasn't fully responsible for all of his actions, according to his attorneys and his expert witnesses. I will explain what all of that means, but ultimately... 
Bradley is found guilty of attempted murder, kidnapping, and the lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter. He's sent to prison for 32 years, and it looks like this defense actually worked. I think that that's a much lighter sentence than I would have expected. Question so far? Um, how old are the kids that are watching this happen? Let's see. I think the eldest was 10 or 11, and then they're all like in short order after that. Under that. That's yeah, they're crazy. all under that. I mean, I just don't see how you can have them probably testify and hear their accounts and then end up with the verdict that you ended up unless, like you said, this is like a legitimate, I want to do air quotes, defense. No, it is. It's actually used quite often now. I know a case in Italy, you know, this person's sentence was reduced dramatically once this um, information was presented. And I come, look, I, I'm also a litigation consultant, a, a jury consultant. So I work in that industry as well. And for me, it's, it's, it's too late by then. Like, if we have this information, let's work on it the way you and I are working on it right now. Let's get it out there. So we know if, you know, heck, my, my son's acting like this. We, we have treatments for it. We can test. Okay, he's going to have some sort of predisposition. So we're going to get into all of those Wait, details. So there is treatment because that's a thing when you're talking about it, I'm kind of like, uh, how do you, how do you even deal with no, right. this knowledge. Right. And I struggle because I have great cases I want to bring on this on this podcast, but it's called How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. So if I can't tell you what to do about it, it's really hard to tell you, oh, here, look for this risk factor and then good luck with that. I struggle. I, I don't know if listeners even want to know if I well, can't give them a solution. Don't they say knowledge is power? I mean, at least knowing that it's there mm -hmm. having that you have the propensity towards it mm -hmm. might at least be better than not knowing. Than being in the dark. Although honestly, it's, I mean, why sometimes I avoid the doctor. It's better. <laughs> don't tell me. I don't want to know that. So. Well, and some, some things re resolve on their own, right? Yeah. This one doesn't. This one doesn't. And there are things you can do. So let's talk about what the MAOA gene is and how it relates to crime. So the MAOA gene is responsible for making an enzyme called monoamine oxidase A. And this enzyme is a part of a family of enzymes that break down molecules called monoamines. And some of those chemicals are neurotransmitters, such as serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Okay, so what do those do? Signals transmitted by serotonin regulate mood, emotion, sleep, appetite. Epinephrine and norepinephrine control the body's response to stress, that's important, and dopamine transmits signals within the brain to smooth physical movements. It's also the reward system. So neurocriminology has recognized that there is a relationship between a specific variation of the MAOA gene and violent criminal behavior. And those who have inherited this version of the gene that's related to either lower or non-existent MAOA are characterized by mild intellectual disabilities, behavioral problems, aggression, violent outbursts. It all began when researcher Han Bruner was approached by a woman in 1978 seeking to understand what she'd seen in generations of her family. All of her male relatives were really aggressive and frightening. And this is a Dutch family. It's a, it was easy for him to study. They were all in one place. But it, it was her who suggested. She suggested, I think there's some sort of genetic problem here because all of my male relatives are acting like this. And I'm here today because I have some daughters and they aren't, but maybe they're carrying it. But my 10-year-old son is starting to act like this. She described it as something she could even see in their eyes. So Han Bruner took this on and he did a meticulous study across these four generations of this particular family. And what he found was astonishing and groundbreaking. And it was published in the peer review publication Science, which is incredibly well respected. This was the defective gene he uncovered, the MAOA gene. So the association of MAOA with aggressiveness, which has earned the nickname the warrior gene from monkey studies, was first described with his identification, and it was called the Bruner syndrome because of his research with that Dutch family. Is it just in men? 
No, it's not. It's not just in men, but it's primarily in men. I believe it's on the X chromosome. So us women, we get two copies of that. So what, what's going wrong with one can be handled by the other's compensation. But if you're male, if you're genetically male, you only have that one X. So whatever's on it, if it's there, you don't have the other X to compensate for it. Now you said it's responsible for those like hormones or neurotransmitters. Is it that it doesn't create the amount that they need? Because I've heard I've heard those referred to as like the feel good genes or the feel good, you know, hormones. So I'm just wondering, there's a correlation. Right. I would say they probably don't feel good if they're out there right. killing people. They they probably don't feel yeah, they probably don't feel well at all. But so like ever. this gene makes the enzyme MAOA, which breaks down the um chemicals. Okay. So it could be that they, you know, it, it's it to get into the neurochemistry is probably too complicated, but essentially these are no longer regulated properly. Right. So, and when they aren't regulated properly, other neurotransmitters and chemicals in your body also get dysregulated. So it's a symphony of a hot mess when you don't have the enzymes to break down these molecules. Here we have this Dutch family. But what he discovers is not only is there a defect, they essentially have no MAOA at all. And this can, you know, I've already, I've already listed some of the things, but it's, there's others, hyperactivity disorder, ADD, alcohol use, like alcoholism, drug abuse, impulsivity is all related to this, high-risk behaviors, adolescent conduct disorders, reduced social cooperation, physical aggression, criminal violence, and my least favorite, recidivism. So if they are violent, they get out, they're doing it again. Unfortunately, we also know that a lack of MAOA can result in lower IQs. And as I've said, you know, a million times, low IQ is a risk factor for crime and violence. Obviously, it's not a curvy line to understand how somebody with a low IQ and impulsivity, who's also using drugs and alcohol, engaging in risky behaviors, um, you know, is super sensitive, which we'll find out too. They're they're hypersensitive. It's not a curvy line to get why this why this could lead to crime. Jean Shi, she was at USC, I think at the same time I was, and she was studying what happens if you knock out the MAOA gene in mice. And there's a whole process to synthesize and knock out genes. What they noticed is they'd come into the lab the next morning and there'd be a dead mouse because the ones who had that gene knocked out would kill the other ones. And then Terry Moffat and Ashlam Caspi at Duke University published another paper in Science in 2002. And this paper demonstrated how the genetic and biological factors we're talking about interact with social factors and how that predisposes somebody even to a higher degree to antisocial violence. And what it specifically is, is they discovered that those with this variation of the MAOA gene combined with child abuse, like, so they have this gene that renders lower MAOA, plus they're abused as children, they're really on the trajectory for criminal behavior. And they did this by assessing more than a thousand kids on factors of antisocial behavior from the ages of three to 21. And within this large group, there were children, plenty of them who had been abused and obviously those who had not, and they were able to compare them. And they found that those with the low levels of MAOA, they were associated with later antisocial behavior, but particularly if they had been abused. So the violence later was particularly strong in the group that had this variation of the gene and were also abused. And that's what Paul Waldrup's defense tried to do. They were saying that this combination of this defective gene combined with abuse that Brad supposedly suffered in childhood, that's what led him to this violent murder and he just couldn't help it. And we can talk about that, but... You know, I'd much rather talk about this before we get to a trial, before, you know, he's gone his whole life without knowing why he's more aggressive and if there's anything we can do about it. Um, because once you're there, I mean, criminal culpability, you and I could talk about all day. What, what does it mean? But what does it mean to reduce his sentence and let him out, too? Yeah. You know, it's absolutely. confusing. Well, that's the thing. There's the academic discussion, which... For the record, I was not a criminal attorney. So, however, as a mom, as a person of the world, as a single woman who could potentially date somebody, it's more interesting to me um, or applicable even, not even interesting, but 
it's kind of like, how can we use this information Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. make society a safer place? And also for the poor person that's carrying that gene, I don't want to call them, you know, feel like, but when you look at it, when you described as the children, they were looking at the children. It's like those poor children that are carrying that gene and the trajectory that they're on. Like, is there a way to step in and help them manufacture more of the enzyme or whatever it is that they that they that need. they're lacking. Well, you can actually approach this in two different ways. So, one of the things that they've discovered while studying this further is that it's not just that they're violent, they have an unusual response to anger, frustration and fear. So, this 2007 study suggests that these individuals are actually hypersensitive and are therefore more affected by negative experiences such as child abuse or trauma. So it's it, it could be this combination, like it's linked to a reactive kind of perceived provocation of traumatic events. So when you can combat this with positive parenting and lack of traumatic experiences, it can actually prevent the aggressiveness that we see in people who have this variation of the gene. So it makes carriers more responsive to both negative and positive factors. So they're more responsive responsive to trauma, but they also respond really well when their parenting experiences are positive. But if you're prone to being a bad parent in the sense of like, you're going to abuse them, are you really going to think, okay, well, at least my child carries this because you also probably carry the gene because it's genetic, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously they're getting it somewhere. Right. So maybe... I love that, you know, the positive parenting can help, but what are the chances that someone that has that gene and has a kid with that gene is going to go, oh, well, maybe if I'm just a better parent, then, you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's too late for them. They were probably already a- abused, but it it does make good parents want to be better parents if you know that it can reduce, you know, the impact of that. Gene, well, and remember, right? if you're a female, and, and we do see this ad- affect females to some degree or another, especially I would imagine if they inherit it on both sides. But, yeah. you know, and I don't know the the, the inheritance uh, mechanism, you know, sometimes you have dominant, you can have dominant recessive, you can also have added genetic effects, you can have, you know, you have to have inherit a cluster of specific genes to turn on a particular behavior. This I just know is in 30% of the population. So it and, and these kids are super susceptible to abuse, but also to positive parenting. So we're in this kind of interesting, yes, if you are an abusive parent, you're not listening to this podcast and looking to me for, you know, what does the research say for answers? No, we're trying to reach those who are like you and me, you know, and like, oh, do our sons carry this? Like, I, you know, I don't know. Can you test for that? Yes. Is that like a 23 and me type of You can situation? test for it. And we're going to put up all the links for that as well. Amazing. While the abuse component is critical, there are also studies that show the direct links between this variation of this gene and aggressive behavior without the abuse component. Men and women with the low MAOA gene have higher levels of lifelong aggression And men specifically have twice the levels of serious delinquency and adult violence than the normal controls. And this is not only self-report, but it's also witnessed in laboratory settings. And we can see it. We can see it in the male brain. So males with this version of the gene, they have an 8% reduction in the volume of their amygdala and their orbital frontal cortex. Now, the amygdala, that's that emotional center in the temp lobe that I talk about all the time. It's a little funky in psychopaths. And then the orbital frontal cortex right here behind your forehead, that is, those are your emergency brakes. The way that you control your impulses, your executive functioning, all of that. There's some idea that there's some suspicion that a buildup of tyramine, which evidently is not being metabolized properly because of this gene, can contribute to the problems associated with the condition. So that's why when we go into what to do about it, food can actually worsen symptoms. Oh, wow. So let me ask you though, because looking at the brain and doing the genetic testing, that's all confirmation of something that probably you already know in this instance of this gene, because they're acting, your child's acting very aggressively, right? Like typically you'll see, because for me, I'm paranoid. I'm also a hypochondriac. So I'm going to be like, do I have this gene? Do my kids have this gene? But if they're not exhibiting 
signs of some of this aggression and some of the stuff that you talked about. Right. I don't need to go have their brain scanned right. tomorrow to make sure they don't carry this gene. That's right. You don't need to go, you know, get their blood work done. You don't, if your children aren't exhibiting these, these problematic behaviors, or if they aren't the first degree relative of somebody with these problems, then, you know, you can, you can listen to the podcast for other problems, but right, right. Yeah. I'm talking this about this is, one specifically. This yeah. one specifically. No, if you're not seeing, you know, these, these uh, behaviors I'm describing, then, you know, don't worry about it. And these behaviors can happen from other things, as we know, disinhibition, right. lack of self-control that can all live just in the frontal cortex and not at all be related to this specific gene. It's just that you got this gene, you're going to also probably have that. It'll be nice too to have some, you know, like I remember earlier when, when my older son was younger, we had some, not, not aggression, but other things. And it was nice to have kind of a, a reason like, oh, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. This is the cause. And then you can, like you said, go to what reduces it, the foods or whatever it is. So it's looking at the signs and then kind of the diagnosis and then yeah, how you handle it. And you have access now. I mean, we have the internet. These studies are all out there. If you don't know what to, what you're looking for, if you don't know to think of this MAOA gene, right. you know, I mean, I'm, it doesn't come in the parenting handbook. Yeah, I just happen to know because I study crime and it, 30% of That's males crazy. have it. That's not That's a small crazy. number. You know, again, anytime I talk about this with people, they're just like, why don't we hear about this? But there are some really serious repercussions for knowing it. And I'm going to get into some of that. Yeah. For example, I mean, first of all, do we want our genes out there for everyone to see? You know, is it, does that one day become public information and people can- Do you have can, to disclose it on a play date? Do we disclose that? Right. Like, oh, my kid has the MAOA gene. Yeah, gene. I mean, can future employers get their hands on this? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But I'll tell you, Han Bruner, as a brilliant researcher, he recognized that this research was going to be controversial. And he had to be very, very careful with how he got this out into the public. This is the problem I've always had with academic research. One of the reasons academicians, the ivory tower, hang on to the results so tightly is because it can be twisted, misunderstood, and cause problems for huge groups of people. But on the flip side, I've spent my career knowing that we walk this fine line between hanging on to information so it's not misused, but also needing to give the information. Of course, we don't want it misconstrued, misappropriated, and hurtful, but we also need to get it out there so that people can use it to impact or reduce bad behavior. I mean, such as in your own home. I don't know, I walk this fine line. I don't have the answers, but I'm going to talk about what, what Han Brunner came up against. And he and every other researcher knows that it's not a single gene for criminal behavior. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not how it works. So he was careful in his study. He used words like abnormal behavior instead of aggression. You know, his work was, it was well contained, but here's an example of how this information can go horribly wrong. A study in New Zealand reported that the Maori population on that island has twice the level of this MAOA variation compared to the Caucasians on the island. Now, that was really juicy to reporters, and they took it, and they ran with it, and they said things like, oh, aha, this now explains the Maori problem, and it was a freaking nightmare. So researchers who did the study tried to correct the information. They said, they were quoted, we've been badly misquoted. We, they argued that the extrapolation and negative twisting of this notion by journalists or politicians to try to explain non-medical antisocial issues like criminality need to be recognized as having no scientific support whatsoever and should be ignored. But it was already out there by then. It was too late. And then people were saying, well, perhaps the Maoris have the warrior gene because remember, they had to embark on long and dangerous voyages from Polynesia to get to New Zealand. And, you know, they probably came across a lot of island tribe attacks. And these were the ones who made it. So naturally, they're passing down this warrior gene. It's a nightmare. We know that this is related to violence. That's unequivocal. But you cannot look at populations of people and start talking about violence in that population. It just doesn't work that way. Right, because you're creating your own, like, subsection of the whole. It's 30% of men. Have it. Right? And, and not all those China. men are violent. Right. Yeah. They just have probably, they could have higher levels of these problems we're talking about. And that could lead to criminal behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. 
FrameBridge makes it easier than ever to custom frame everything that matters without ever leaving the house, which means you can easily give a thoughtful gift this holiday season. I've been lucky enough to have a ton of incredible experiences with the people I love this past year, and I'd like to do something special for each of them. FrameBridge is the perfect way to frame what matters most to them. So whether it's a selfie with your best friend, their game-winning jersey, or a special anniversary dinner menu, consider framing it with FrameBridge. Give them a gift only you could give. This year, I am taking old family Christmas cards and framing them as gifts. Some of these date back to the 70s, and they are incredible. My family will love having them to keep forever. Get started today. Frame your photos or give someone the perfect gift. Go to framebridge.com and place your order today. It's really exhausting and hard to do these because I, I feel like we need the information out there, but we need to also tell you, like, you, we're talking about your individual child or your individual husband. Yeah. This is not something you can be, you know, going and demanding we test everybody for because it just isn't, it's not that simple. It's yeah. not, oh, you have this gene, criminal, you should be. Does it lead to criminal behavior in lots of people? Mm -hmm. It does. As we've already seen how important the environment is, if you couple it with child abuse, it's far worse. I think anything coupled with child abuse is probably far, far worse. There are some children who are so resilient that, yeah. you know, they go on to survive and thrive. But most of us aren't. Most of us are highly affected by trauma. Yeah. Um, and there's some people for whom there is no resilience at all. Like once there's been trauma, it's really hard to get back on track. And then there's these people who have a trigger, a predisposition, you know, the trigger of being abuse, a predisposition yeah. toward violence and boom, you know, a perfect storm. Any specific questions about Brad and his family and this gene before I start talking about, well, what the hell do we do about it? Yes, I do have a question. Yeah. Do people with this gene often get misdiagnosed with a certain psychological disorder or are they more susceptible to a specific psychological disorder? Like conditions that have these characteristics like conduct disorder, oppositional defiance disorder, antisocial personality disorder. Yeah, they're definitely even psychopathy. They are definitely going to be much more likely to get those diagnoses, ADHD all of that, you're going to see that more often in these groups. It's a, um, this is a tough one. You know, it's, um, and it's not the only gene, by the way, that we've seen a single gene. I talk all the time about how combination of genes can predispose somebody to violence. Um, but this is one. As a lay person. <laughs> Are you a lay person? I'm a lay person. This is like terror. I don't even know what to do with this information. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, it's so interesting that we can have like a defense and stuff, but I'm, you know, again, it's like, how do I, what do I do with this information as, and we talked a little bit about a parent. If you see the aggression, then you can kind of test for this and you can have an answer. But like as a human out there in the world, it's a little disconcerting that like 30% of the male population have the propensity because they have this gene and there's not really anything you can do about it. But we can as moms, we can. And that's, you know, when I get up and I'm like, oh gosh, what am I nervous about my podcast? I'm a very thin skinned person. And I'm like, nope, I got to get this out here because I sure as shit want to know. Yeah. You know, I want to know like, okay, I see this behavior. I've tried biofeedback. That's helping. Okay. I've got the fish oil in place. That's helping. But if I can look at the cause and find if there's specific treatments for that specific yeah. cause, I mean, lo look at what how we treat uh, for a stupid example, breast cancer. We treat all, we know how to treat cancer. We can throw chemo at it. We can throw radiation. But if we know that this particular breast cancer is caused by a particular hormone, we can have targeted therapy. We still have therapy for all breast cancer, but we can have a targeted therapy. And that's why I do this. Like, okay, I'm not an expert in MAOA. I mean, in behavioral right. geneticist, but I, you know, I'm not looking at specific genes, but this, all right, well, what are there things that we can do specifically for this variation of this gene. But before I even get in there, I need to tell you something super creepy. When I was researching this case, I came across consumer websites where you can get this tested and the way that it's marketed is like, have a better life, get in control of yourself, 
no, you're, you know, it was like, um, like a gym advertisement, like wow. this is you and now you can do something about it. Of course, it didn't tell you what to do about it, but it really was like, what if you're one of them? Don't you want to know? Oh I gosh. was taken aback that somebody has consumerized this, like marketed, commercialized it. I'm thinking it, of it. Okay. Well, like which doctors do we have to go to a geneticist? How does it work? No, there's regular consumer sites that you can tap on and be like, come on kids, let's go get tested. Creepy. I mean, I'm glad it's out there. Such a whole, like, rab I was like, uh, such a rabbit hole that we can go down for that yeah. as far as, like, do you get tested and where does the information go and all that kind of stuff. It's get tested if you're worried if that, you, want you, have, to. that yeah. you or a loved one have this gene because there apparently are things that you can do with this knowledge. Yeah. Yes. So that's my caveat. I'm not saying everyone take out your impulsive ADHD kids and go get them tested. I am not advocating that for that because I don't know what the repercussions will be. Yeah. I am saying if you want to know and you want to do it, do it because there are things that you can do or you can also just implement these changes I'm about to mention without even knowing you have this gene yeah, or to not. everybody. You can. They're not. It, I'm not going to say go take some crazy ass medicine. They're really simple and they're actually just really healthy. But you might have to start treating your home and your diet as if you had, I don't know, um, somebody with celiac in it who just couldn't have it, somebody with a severe food allergy, because this is it, a lot of it's food based. Now, I need to create a caveat here. There are problems with variations of this gene that cause both high and low activity in MAOA. So you don't necessarily want to blow up your MAOA either, but you you can do these things to find some possible benefits. Do these strategies balance it? Because there's some strategies that it doesn't matter if you're high or low for things, it will balance it. Are these ones that will actually boost or reduce or are they more of like a balancing? These thing? are boosters and ba okay. balancing and boosting. But of course, speak with your doctor before you do anything. I am not a medical doctor. You know, I'm, I got these from somebody who's been, you know, on the internet from somebody who's been researching it. There's not a lot of academic articles talking about what to do next, but I can't bring it on this podcast without finding, digging deep and finding something. Absolutely. And these are, I think, really good, healthy lifestyle changes. And I can't, I don't see how you could screw anything up by doing this. Yeah. Um, but of course, before you try any, you know, alternative strategies, you need to talk to a doctor. But here they are. They're pretty innocuous. Stress management. People with low MAOA activity are more likely to have impaired function from chronic stress they, they could get PTSD, chronic fatigue syndrome. So, and they're more susceptible to stress during childhood and becoming antisocial and aggressive, all of this. So there's just a really reasonable argument to reduce any trauma that you can reduce. Obviously don't abuse your children, but try to make it as, as stress-free as you can. Being a child is incredibly stressful, even though we diminish that as parents because we think who cares about Susie fighting with Robbie at school. It doesn't matter, but it does to them. And their brains and their hormones are responding as if it's a real trauma. So we need to appreciate and meet them where they are in terms of stress in childhood. It's as simple as, and I know I say this all the time, stress busting, yoga, meditation, you know, bring them to the therapist, anything you can do to help them reduce stress. Because these children with this variation of MAOA are far more susceptible to it. So your other kid might be fine but this kid isn't. Can I just say for this, you know, my background, which we didn't talk about after the, I left the law, I went to um, nutrition school, learned all about holistic nutrition. And then that's when I became a life coach. So I just want to say to parents, probably moms that are listening, that it's harder to reduce your child's stress when you have your own stress. And so I would say, do these things together. I started meditating with my um, older son we started do, I started doing yoga, just some of those like fun YouTube videos with my younger son. But I feel like the things that you're about to say are going to make the family life, everybody's stress level go down and who wouldn't benefit. Not only will your child not become a serial killer, thank the Lord, but you might actually have like a happier home life if you implement at least the stress reduction, just the one that you started with. Because I'm thinking of the mom that's listening, who's dealing with a child that's super aggressive, maybe hitting her, maybe having some of these symptoms if they do have the gene and they're probably at their wits end and they don't mm -hmm. know what to do. And then we say, well, like, well, why don't you just try yoga? And they're like, I don't have time. I don't have exactly. space. And it's like, 
make that space for yourself. And then, you know, my, when I was in therapy, my therapist said, the husband is supposed to be the endless pitcher of milk into the wife. And then the wife is kind of supposed to be into the kids, which is a very beautiful picture. But if you don't have somebody that's pouring into you and you're pouring everything into your kids, make sure that you find something. And it's not hokey pokey. It's not like, oh, take some minutes out for yourself. These things work. Meditation and yoga, they they change your brain. They work. So yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for the personal experience because it's not hard if you if you just think I'm going to do it for myself and I'm going to bring the kids into it and not make it weird. Like, hey, you, child number two or child right. number one, you need this, but your brother doesn't. Right. You know, you incorporate into a family lifestyle. And I think that's brilliant. Um, the next one is a total no-brainer, no smoking, tobacco, <laughs> substances in tobacco other than nicotine function. Like they, they are, can function as MAOA inhibitors. They can worsen the effects. My uh, master's thesis was all about the effects of of prenatal smoking on antisocial behavior in the future. And by the way, children with MAOA um, variants are more susceptible. So you smoke while you're pregnant, your kid's way more likely to be um, aggressive in the future. I mean, are they, is it because they're related to somebody who's going rogue and smoking while pregnant or is it doing something to them? Well, now we also know that those kids are more susceptible to children who do actually have this variation of MAOA gene. So don't smoke around them. Don't smoke when you're pregnant with them. Nobody should be smoking anyway. This is your public service announcement. Stop freaking smoking. Okay. Yes. This is where we can actually do something today that might feel a little bit more empowering in its diet. So it turns out that in addition to monoamine neurotransmitters, MIOA also break down dietary monoamines such as tyramine. Oh, this is going to be rough. Phenothylamine, tryptamine, and histamine. You got to get rid of those. The main food sources, because if you don't have enough of this MAOA to break down your neurotransmitters, you're not having enough of them to break down these. And the main food sources of these compounds are aged cheese, cured or smoked meat and fish, pickled or fermented vegetables, alcoholic drinks, chocolate, soy products, and shellfish. What you need to be doing is creating a high protein, low carbohydrate diet for your child. And you need to treat them like they are allergic to the foods I just mentioned. Now, maybe I'm taking that too far. I don't care. I can't imagine it hurts you to not have those things. But diets rich in carbohydrates and low in proteins will increase levels of things like tryptophan in the brain. And if you don't have the ability to break those down, you know, it, it that can be bad. So we want low carbohydrate, protein rich diets. Perhaps that's what's going on in the brain. Why we see the differences in the brain, it's buildup of stuff because you don't have these enzymes to break these chemicals down. Well, histamine, I mean, you said treat it like you're allergic, but essentially you are allergic. If you think of antihistamines mm-hmm. that help you with your allergies, I did actually research hip histamine um, intolerance for my own purposes oh. a while ago. Yeah. And I was gonna say fermented foods, that's like kombucha, all the things that are all the rage right now, sauerkraut, you know, these things that yeah. people might be giving their kids thinking they're doing a good thing by balancing their gut. Cause they say the gut is the second brain. So these moms might be hearing from their doctors or from the internet or wherever, um, that this is going to balance the gut and it's going to affect the brain. And so going back to the doctor and asking about histamine testing or whatever Ah. it is could be really good because if you have too much histamine, it definitely, I mean, you, if anyone's ever had allergies, you know, it's not a pleasant experience and it can show up in different ways in your body. So, you know, that's a really good point. And I'm really glad I did not think of that. And I'm glad you said it. We are, you can be the mom, the dad, the parent, the aunt, who's like, I'm going to take care of my child's microbiome. So you're giving them things like sauerkraut. And like you said, but inadvertently, screwing this other balance up or yes. not helping this other balance that needs to be devoid of those fermented foods. Yeah. So that's a great point. You know, this is a reason if you want to get tested, at least you'll have that information. Like, look, I'm not yeah. going to worry as much about gut health as I am going to worry about keeping these other chemicals low. It's not just that. It's like um, candida. There's a lot mm-hmm. of, there's a lot of conditions that you can have that these things, and this is with everything, you know, they say you should have more butter. And then it's like, you shouldn't or whatever. But in this instance, having less of those, it could actually be boosting just to your point could be boosting the problem too. So 
Yeah. Yeah. So you don't want to make it worse. Even if you do nothing at all, you certainly don't want to be adding to it. Right. And then the last um, suggestion, which again, run this by your doctor, but in studies in animal studies, they've seen that physical exercise greatly reduces the MAOA activity. So if your child or yourself, if you have already reduced MAO activity, physical exercise, which is amazing and you have to do it, could create a little bit of a reduction there. But if you administer, if you take white mulberry extract, that in certain studies have restored this activity to normal values. So it could be that adding, again, I'm not a medical doctor, go talk to your doctor about this, but perhaps adding white mulberry extract to your diet, your children's diet, could offset this weird phenomenon that can, can happen in animals when they exercise. Because exercise is key. It is super key if you have a kid exhibiting some of these things. Like you need your kid keep your kid moving. But it could be that there is some sort of deleterious effect of that, maybe small. You know, the value of it could be, the, the effect of it could be very minimum. But if white mulberry extract doesn't hurt you, then maybe adding it in is, is the way to combat that. Yeah, that's another example where they say like, if your kid suffers from ADHD or any of this aggression, get them exercising more. So mm -hmm. if you don't have that information, I mean, it's a simple uh, mm -hmm. solution, like you said. And maybe. so the, the takeaways are this, like 30% of the population has this variation of this gene. And I'm talking just variation, like you have gene variations for eye color. Mine are blue. That means I carry two of the genotype that creates the phenotype of blue eyes. It's recessive. Like it's not a defect so much as it, it's just a variation and it, right. and it occurs in different populations at different frequencies. So, okay, get tested if you want to get tested. I put out the caveats for that. I don't know what's going to hap happen. I mean, hip is a thing, but I don't know what's going to happen with personal information as time goes on. So, well, they say to you can, I'm doing this with my 23 and me, um, that you can use initials because yes. it's going to be sent back to your house. So you can just put or whatever you want. You can put whatever you want so that it's not exactly your name okay. um, on Perfect. it. Perfect. Just to keep your privacy because that's Let's do that. very Initials. important. And I just, what you said, I just want to say that because they called it the warrior gene and it's genetically predisposed. And it sounds like the gene is this bad thing, but the way you just described it, that it's essentially not, it's just a variation mm -hmm. and it's just essentially what your DNA holds in and of itself. It's the expression of the gene that is, I'm, I know nothing about science and maybe I'm saying the words wrong or maybe no, it's not really smart, but the expression of the gene that is the problem, not the gene itself. Right. And I think people would say like, oh my God, I have that gene. I'm a monster. But it's like, no, no, no. This is why we're talking about this because you have this gene. Let's just kind of tweak the, just like you're genetically predisposed to cancer, that's the expression of the gene and you can, you know, have more kale and do more things that will hopefully, you know, yeah. reduce the expression of it. So I feel like that's exactly know. what it is. Genotype is these are the genes you have. This is the gene it, that exists. Phenotype is what it expresses as what it looks like. So you could carry a brown eye gene and a blue eye gene, but that's your genotype. But your phenotype is going to be brown eyes because right. brown is dominant. So that is a very important distinction. You carry all sorts of random things in your genes, but how they are expressed, sometimes it's solely genetic, like eye color, yeah. but sometimes it's the phenotype is not only dependent on the gene. Yes, maybe yeah. these people are synthesizing less of this enzyme, but maybe this can be offset so they never have this phenotype of aggression. You know, these are all, that's a really important distinction. I'm glad you said that. So, okay, yeah, takeaways. You can test for this. It's easy to find. You can get rid of those foods. They're not really good for you foods anyway. I mean, the ones I listed, which again are cured and smoked meat and fish, aged cheeses, pickled and fermented vegetables, alcoholic drinks. Wait, I'm not reducing that. Chocolate, beer. soy products, yeah, fermentation, and shellfish. And high protein, low carbohydrate, reduce stress, stop freaking smoking. I mean, that's it. And talk to your doctor about adding white mulberry extract. Yes. I mean, I think that's, I think that's, that's not that hard to do and evidently it works. So again, you know, test or don't test, but there are things that you, you could even do without testing. So what are you going to do? Are you going to test your kids? <laughs> I'm um, not. <laughs> Only not because my, this my boy's too mellow. I was going to say my, my, my children do not exhibit aggression yet. Um, but 
I feel like this is good information to have. I'm going to look forward to your other episodes on other genes and other, you know, if I thought that it was something that I'm seeing signs of and that I could do something about, not only would I protect society, but it would make my life better. Mm -hmm. I'm all for it. But back to Brad, maybe he'll listen and he'll drink some mulberry juice. (laughs) He's going to need a lot more than that at this point. (laughs) But this is another important artifact, right? Because we're seeing how this information can can be used in in court, you yeah. know, and in some cases it, you get your sentence reduced. And what are the repercussions of that? I mean, again, sixty percent of ma- incarcerated males have head injuries. There are things that are making people less criminally responsible, but I don't know if that's supposed to translate to shorter sentences unless there's a way to combat these biological influences. Well, that's the thing. Can you like make force mulberry juice part of the sentence? Probably not, right? Like, Well, we do it with meditation and omega-3s and biofeedback and all of that. I mean, they're starting to. There are studies that that are forcing it. And it's working. I mean, I could see it being forced as part of a sentence in response to an actual crime that they've been proven to have committed, Mm -hmm. right? To force them to drink the juice of a mulberry. Um, or meditate or cut out beer and smoking and fish, smoked fish. And I don't think they're serving aged cheese in prison (laughs) (laughs) or smoked salmon, you know, or wine. Yeah. I mean, there's, if it's, if you can implement, if you can take this podcast, you can extrapolate it to prisons and you can say, look, this person's not, we are not all created equal. This person did have less of an ability to combat and stop these behaviors than your average person. And if you do want to make that part of the sentencing of the criminal, then you better have a way for them to improve. Because otherwise, you're just taking this person who you've decided is not as liable as you and me for their behavior and making it so that they are out there. Not as liable, but more likely to commit the crime. Like, that's a frightening kind of balance of information. Right. Like, I'm all for it. Like, I'm the first one to say, this guy has no frontal lobe function right now that I mean he does but such as little he can't control any impulse so it's he didn't have the option to consider right from wrong but do I necessarily want him cruising the street no you know I, I I see both sides of this but I think it's important to realize that if you accept that that liability and then what we do about it are different things because remember one of the I mean it, is, it has been replicated over and over again. One of the side effects of having this variation of this gene is recidivism, yeah. which means coming out and reoffending. You know, there are people who go to prison, they come out, they never do anything again. And we see it with, you know, the people who immediately have a, a psychological attention and they're meditating and they're doing yoga and they're taking their omegas, threes and blah, 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 blah. We see reduction in recidivism. It's been proven. But this person is more likely to commit a crime and more likely to do it again when he's out of prison. Not speaking about this particular Walter guy. I don't know anything about him specifically. Maybe he's be, maybe he's done all of this in prison. I don't know. I'm just saying in general, you know, it's if recidivism is one of the things we're seeing, then we have to be careful with how we treat it in a court of law. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's Thank God we're not the ones that are going to try to figure out how to make use of this information and balance it in society because I have no clue. Except I have worked on cases and that was my job. So well, it is, it's not me then. <laughs> <laughs> it's a complicated, you know, I mean, expert witnesses come and he had an expert witness and they come and they're like, look, the combination of this gene, which he could not help, and his childhood trauma, which he could not help made it almost impossible for him not to do this. And, you know, I'm not sure how, you know, the deliberations, I don't have access to deliberations, but his sentence was, was, you know, what he was charged for and what he was actually convicted for were were pretty disparate. And it seems like that argument worked. Yeah. But I like that you at least come with, he couldn't help himself, but maybe we can help. Not Mm -hmm. him, but like people in similarly situated circumstance. And as more research comes out, again, sometimes I bring these things up and they're still in their nascency. We, you know, we're going to constantly have more and more information, but now it's on your radar. Now you guys can do the Google searching. Shit. I know everybody in my family is lacking this or has this MAO variation. I'm going to keep on top of it. And I'm always going to look for new studies and new ways to combat these side effects. 
Well, and parents, again, in the context of your podcast, are going to do it in the most kind of loving way possible because there's like a selfish component built in because this is your child and you want to make their life better and you want to make your life better. And then by doing that, you're also making society better. So, I mean, I think it's great to come in through the parent instead of the court system or the doctors or the government. It's like, you know, to be able to come in early makes the best sense. Absolutely. Let's get ahead of it. Thank you, Rachel. You were incredible. You asked really good questions and you've made me think about this even more. So I'm going to revisit this particular topic again. And thank you for inspiring more, more research and more questions. I appreciate it. Of course. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So this is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and we will see you again soon. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N. T-R-A-S-K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at how not to raise a serial killer at gmail.com or call and leave a voicemail at 818-392-4403. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week.